Natalie, and it's really great to be back with this group. Uh, I see many friendly faces, and uh, even in a smaller space, the humor is very strong today, so it's very encouraging to see. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about MECED. Uh, MECED is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we've been in Charlotte since 2006, and our role is basically to help all citizens in our community understand that it's in everyone's best interest that we have strong and effective public schools in all of our zip codes. Uh, the three words that we use to best describe our work is that we try to educate, we try to engage the community, but also to have an impact. It's great to educate and engage folks, but if you don't have an impact, then you really haven't done what you need to do. Um, we have a very effective advo advocacy committee. It's chaired by Wes Jones. Um, MECED realizes that we need to be very thoughtful in what our advocacy work is. And so we probably, I probably came up with five or six issues that we need to address, but we decided this year to narrow those down to two. And the two public policy agenda items that we really focus on, one is about the teaching profession and valuing teachers and valuing the importance of good teachers. Uh, Natalie mentioned in my past history, I was a principal, high school principal for 13 years, and I dare say the most important thing that I ever did was hire a good teacher, but then secondly, hang on to those good teachers. And I'm worried that that's, not, that's become even more challenging for principals these days. Our second uh, item that we focus on is uh, pre-K. We believe that early childhood education is absolutely essential to long-term success for public schools. So what's going on in public education? Uh, there's a lot in the news these days. Um, there's a lot of angst these days. And so one of the things that MECED tries to do is we try to provide a nonpartisan, objective point of view. So our, our website is full of all kind of information, but that's our role, to provide information and then let you draw your own conclusions to the way where, where things are today. So let's talk about some of those things. Let's talk about teacher compensation, since that seems to be a very popular topic in the news these days. And um, I think it's important to always have a historical perspective of where we've been to figure out where we're going. And most of you have probably scanned these numbers already as you're sitting in your chairs, but 2008 wasn't that long ago. And back in 2008, North Carolina was a progressive state in the southeast, in the country for that matter, we were ranked 25th in the nation in how we paid our teachers. But when we got to 2013, um, we, we've dropped. We've dropped to 46th. And I know that's hard to accept, but that's the reality of where we are today, from 25th to 46th. And our average, average neighboring state teacher salaries are substantially higher. And if you compare us to the national average, we've really fallen behind. Uh, if you've heard our superintendent speak, he talks about how challenging it is for us in our district to be able to recruit some of the best and brightest teachers from outside of our state. And I remember, um, as a principal, we always used to make fun of South Carolina. That well, at least we're not behind South Carolina. Well, if I offended somebody from South Carolina today, you get the last laugh, because right now we are behind South Carolina. Oops. So this, this map kind of tells it all. And when you look at these states that surround us, and you look at what average teacher salaries are, we have somehow fallen behind everybody. And some of our neighboring states are being very thoughtful and very effective in recruiting our teachers. There are actually ads in newspapers in Wake County, um, ads in Mecklenburg County, trying to recruit teachers away. And I could tell you story after story after story of people who are leaving, but what concerns me is not just those who are leaving, but those from other states that used to come here. And uh, it's, it's more difficult for them these days. So where are we today? I just told you that we're 46th in average teacher salaries. We're also 46th in per people expenditures. Per pupil expenditures are the dollar amount that every principal receives in their school to buy textbooks, to buy supplies, and this has dropped significantly. 
so this, this means that PTAs need to work harder. This means that other groups are being asked to fund things in schools. And I can tell you in our high poverty schools, this is much more challenging than it is our more affluent schools. Um, we're 48th in starting teacher salary pay. So that's another one where we continue to drop, but if you drop down to that bottom, 51st, you're wondering, I thought there were only 50 states. Well, this also includes the District of Columbia. But when you look at where North Carolina has been from 2002 to 2003 school year to where we are now, we are dead last. We have done less than any other state in raising teacher salaries. So that's, that's the one that really grabbed me when I read that. So UNC Wilmington um, has a strong school of education and they often put together some very thoughtful surveys. Uh, this last survey they did went out to about 2,700 people, so it is considered to be statistically significant. And 94% of the parents who took this survey believe that raising North Carolina teacher pay should be a priority in 2014. This is not a small number. 94% is quite high. And also, 94% of parents believe that North Carolina is heading in the wrong direction when it comes to public education. And 96% of the parents who disagreed with the removal of additional pay for teachers earning a master's degree in education. When I was a teacher, when I was a principal, teachers who earned their master's degree were paid a little bit more. And teachers who went on to earn a doctorate were paid a little bit more. And I can tell you, it wasn't that much. After slaving for three years to get my doctorate, my take-home pay was $151 a month more. So it's not that much. But the reality is we're not doing this anymore. And so this is another cause for, for angst. Uh, and also this, I don't, I don't know if you're aware, but there's legislation that's in the courts right now about vouchers. Uh, it's called the Scholarship Opportunity Act, and it would provide poor children with a $4,200 voucher to use in place of going to a traditional public school. But I think it's interesting to know that the average uh, per people expenditure for each student is about $8,200 across the state, and the voucher will only be $4,200. So one has to wonder what kind of education are we going to be able to get for $4,200? This is in the courts right now, but 85% of the people who took the survey don't agree with the private school vouchers. And this is where public school dollars could go to fund church schools and private schools. So let's talk about how this affects us on a local instance. Uh, Eric Davis was here earlier today. Eric Davis, one of our school board members, someone that I have tremendous respect for and one of your Rotarians. Eric Davis and the school board often get beat up for something they really can't control. Eric Davis and the school board do not have any taxing authority. So they have to get their funding from two different, well really three sources, but two main sources. The state, the General Assembly, and the local, the county, our board of county commissioners. And so the superintendent has recently requested a $46 million increase from the Mecklenburg County Board of County Commissioners. And he's asking for a 3% pay raise for teachers. And that costs $27 million. Now, 3% may not sound like much, but our teachers in CMS have received one, one and a half percent raise in the past six years. So the superintendent feels this is extremely important, so he's asking for it. Um, but he also doesn't really know what's going to happen from the state. We do hear that there will be a pay increase for some teachers, but that's not quite official yet. So the Board of Education votes to accept this on May the 13th. The county manager's but goes to the county manager's budget May the 29th, and then the Board of County Commissioners votes on this June the 12th. So you're wondering, why is Bill Anderson telling me about these dates? These dates are extremely important for uh, CMS as they seek more funding from the county because we don't really know what's going to happen from the state so far. Let's talk about pre-K. Pre-K education, the other issue that we feel is extremely important. There is proof that for every dollar spent on pre-K, there's a $7 return on investment. Um, graduation rates can increase up to 50% for those students who have pre-K. 
uh, and improve school readiness for those students who are at risk. Um, and there are currently are about 12,000 students across our state who are eligible for pre-K services but are unable to get them because the seats are not available. So what is MECED doing? Well, MECED, as you know, we are an advocacy group. We advocate for effective public schools across every zip code in our county. So we've put together this electronic toolkit slash advocacy toolkit, and it, the, you'll notice the title is Children About Politics. Someone once told me, a very wise man once told me, a guy named Joe Peel, who was my principal at Myers Park High School, who really was the one that pushed me to become a school administrator. He said, Bill, if you always make all of your decisions in the best interest of the students you serve, you're always going to make the right decision. And so we came up with this, Children Above Politics. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to encourage our community to reach out to those folks who are in power that make these decisions to really think about how we need to fund public schools. And so that's what we've done here. Um, but today's world is different than 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you get a group of people in a room and you talk to them and they go out and do their thing. Uh, today, we find that social media is a very effective tool for advocacy. And so that's what we're doing. We're asking people to, you know, the, the do's and don'ts of advocacy. Do not be mean-spirited to lawmakers. Work with people, don't insult people, talk to them, share the facts, tell a personal story. Uh, a personal story from my perspective was when I was principal at Myers Park High School, we had about 35 classes that had 40 students or more. Today, they have over 100. So the, the reality is, is that class size is getting bigger, teacher turnover rates are a real challenge, um, people aren't going into the profession, they're staying in the profession for a much shorter period of time because they really don't see a great long-term career. I was much more fortunate. I had people in my building that had been there 20, 25 years. I look out here at Ed Driggs, who now serves in the city council, both of his kids got a fantastic education at Myers Park, part of the IB program, but I dare say that about half of those teachers aren't there any longer. And the reason they've left, it's not just salary, it's because they don't feel like our society values the profession of teaching. So that's what MECED is, is trying to do. So um, it's really easy, uh, it's, it's also, you notice this little hashtag here, it's hashtag get on the bus. So this is what we're trying to do. So if you're interested in learning more about our advocacy work, it's very easy to get involved. www.meched.org. Click on our electronic toolkit and you can send it out to all your friends as well. There's one other thing that I want to talk about that MECED believes in strongly. And this is that we really need to ensure that every child have some, that graduates high school has some sort of post-secondary education. Unfortunately, America is behind the curve when it comes to what that really means. The Europeans are light years ahead of us in how they help prepare young people for careers. Um, Tony Zeiss is a master at figuring this out. He has relationships with Siemens and some of the other European companies where, first of all, quick statistic, about 60% of all kids that graduate high school in America go on to a traditional four-year school and do well. But there are 40% who do not. But we still have this idea that everybody needs to go into a four-year school. Well, there's this guy from Harvard named Bob Schwartz who wrote this white paper back in 2011 called Pathways to Prosperity. And he says that that four-year traditional college uh, education is actually harmful for some kids, and it also racks up a lot of debt. So we need to do a better job of helping students have these workplace learning opportunities, internships and apprenticeships while they're still in high school. So we have the, the Charlotte Chamber, MECED, CPCC, and CMS have Bob Schwartz coming to Charlotte next Monday and Tuesday. And you are more than welcome to come hear Bob Schwartz speak and it's going to be at the Harris campus. Thank you, Tony. And he's going to be discussing the Pathways to Prosperity Report, and we'd love for you to come, because we believe that the future workforce is going to look different than the one today. I'll bet 99% of you here in this room went to a four-year liberal arts college. And I will tell you that the future is going to look different. Not everybody needs that degree. They need more technical degrees. 
Uh, Tony has kids graduating after two years uh, in the mechatronics program that are going out and making $50,000 a year working in advanced manufacturing. Um, so I just wanted to throw that little plug in at the end. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. I know our time is fairly limited, but I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, John. Uh, 